Ryan Peterson is a biblical researcher and writer with an emphasis in ancient Hebrew thought and theology. So uh, most of us, or many of us rather, are familiar with that passage in, in Genesis uh, that, that mentions the, uh, the sons of God uh, sort of commingling with the daughters of men and creating this hybrid, these um, Nephilim. Where else in the Bible do we hear about the Nephilim? Genesis 6 certainly is the first place we see them, but the, um, the giants certainly appear throughout the Old Testament before and after the flood. The most notable account of the giants, um, of course, being David and Goliath, and, you know, which is probably one of the most well-known biblical accounts ever. And the interesting thing is that, it, you know, it's commonly accepted when one reads the Bible or is in Sunday school class that Goliath was a giant, but there's no real context given as to why he had this supernatural size. And so a lot of the idea behind the book was really to get into the, the details the Bible gives to certain historical events and certain figures where it's trying to draw a very important point for us to look at. And when you look even at Goliath, where he describes his, his height being six cubits in a span, and, of course, you know, the, the Egyptian cubit was anywhere from 18 to 21 inches. So, you, so putting his height anywhere, he could be anywhere from 9 to 11 feet. And even the weight of all his armor is estimated to be, a, you know, a roughly 200 pounds. So this was someone of, of a immense superhuman strength. So there's just one example. In Numbers 13, of course, another famous account of the 12 spies that Moses sent to scout the Promised Land, where 10 of those spies came back doubting that Israel could conquer the Promised Land and, and capture it as God promised to them because they saw three giants, Ahimon, Seshai, and Talmai. And this, of course, is in Numbers chapter 13, who were the sons of Anak. And, you know, it's interesting that, again, when you look at it in the broader context, Israel had just come out of the Exodus. They just saw God perform the greatest series of supernatural plagues at one time, you know, to, to, uh, to force their release from Pharaoh in Egypt. The, cr the crossing of the Red, the parting of the Red Sea had just taken place. And right, so they saw all the supernatural works of God, and yet all it took was seeing three giants who, you know, and you go to Numbers 13, you know, they said that the, that the spies said that we were as grasshoppers in their sight. And it just took three giants for them to say, we cannot take this land and doubt that the God that had just parted the Red Sea, that had just conquered the Egyptian armies for them, they lost all hope in the, in the face of three Nephilim. How can we be certain, Ryan, that the, the, the giants described in Numbers and Genesis are in fact the, the offspring of the fallen angels, the sons of God. Uh, for example, uh, what is the, the etymology of, of the word Nephilim? There are several definitions that are commonly used uh, for, the, for the Nephilim, but I, I tend to go with, you know, with these, they're often described as either being tyrants or the fallen or something of that nature, looking at the Hebrew word, but I actually have a different, go with a different definition. I believe it really comes from Aramaic. It's really a borrowed term from Aramaic, and it really just means giants. And so in the book, I quote a 19th century source, a 19th century researcher, Francois Lenormand, and he basically explains, he cites, you know, the, the Targum, the Kessel, the Syriac version. So he's referencing all these older manuscripts of the Bible, of the Old Testament, rather, where Nephilim just means giant. It explains that that root of Nephil, of Nephil even Nephila, referring to a, a giantess, that all that was used throughout history, throughout Hebrew history, and it just meant giant. So it, that's, that is the actual etymology of the word Nephilim. And I think that we can find the support for that in that when you look at, say, the Septuagint, which we cite in, uh, in Judgment of the Nephilim, it is, and in that is the oldest extant version of the Old Testament. You know, of course, translated from Paleo-Hebrew to Greek, the word giants is used, or gigantes in Greek, but giants is used throughout. So 
that to me provides good confirmation historically as well as grammatically that when we're looking at the word Nephilim, it actually means giant. Something that has always uh, troubled me, and that is I've never been able to wrap my head around this. My my perception, and it may be incorrect, is when I think of the angelic realm, I think of angels and fallen angels. I think of spiritual entities. So how then does an angel or a fallen angel have relations or shall I say, how does it reproduce with a human woman? Right. And so I think a lot of the common perception of angels is that they are immaterial, that they're ghost-like. And so, of course, it raises this question. And so the first thing to establish is that angels themselves have bodies. They have a physical presence in, in the earthly realm. They can manifest with a physical presence. And so there are just a number of examples of that. So uh, in Genesis chapter 18, when two angels along with God visit the home of Abraham, they wash their feet, their feet are washed, they eat food. Um, so they clearly have a physical presence. Uh, in at Sodom and Gomorrah, the two angels came to rescue Lot. They they come into Lot's home. They can they can push. They pull Lot back into the house. They can angels can physically interact with human beings. They can attack people. They can kill people. And so, and even you know in the Psalms, it refers to man and says that men did eat angels' food. So even the, from a physiological standpoint, they eat food that humans can actually eat. The same manna that was falling from heaven during the time of the Exodus in the wilderness, the psalmist says that, that was, that's food that angels actually consume. So they clearly have a physical presence that they can manifest. And what is really interesting, though, is that is a passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that not only explains that angels have a body, but also explains that angels have a seed. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 36 to 40, you know, it's, it's a very interesting passage. Paul, the Apostle Paul is, is talking about the resurrection of the dead and how, what happens, what happens to the, to the body when you are resurrected to a, to a glorified, eternal body in heaven, for, if you're a believer. What we read there, and I'll just quote right from the, right from the passage, it says that and thou, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that the body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So what this is saying is that you don't, to raise up a, a plant, you have to have a seed. And it says, but God gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. And so I think this is where the Bible is informing us that there is a celestial flesh. I believe that's the angelic body and the terrestrial, the human body. But that every being, every creature that God has made that has a body has a seed. And so... That in seed, of course, refers to DNA, reproduction, genetics, and that's where um, I think we can establish biblically. And then you take that and you combine it with the testimony of Genesis chapter 6, where it says the sons of God went in unto the doors of men and bare children. I mean, that's a very clear reference to sexual relations leading to the birth of a child. Then you take the testimony from the book of Jude, where we read that the angels who sinned, who left their first estate and sinned and went after strange flesh. It compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah, talking about fornication. Second Peter chapter 2, again, making the same reference, so that the, there is a certain sect, subgroup of angels who rebelled against God for the specific sin of fornication in the days of Noah. I think when you put that all together, you have a very compelling case. The Bible is telling you that not only are angels physical, that they actually have a seed and can reproduce with human women. Not to get too graphic here, but I'm trying to imagine a, a human woman giving birth to a giant. And how would a, a woman survive such a thing? These hybrids, as you pointed out, would be some of them 8, 9, 10, 11 feet tall. We're talking about what must be an incredibly you know, large uh, infant 
Uh, are there any ancient texts that actually describe a human woman giving birth to one of these hybrids? I have not come across texts that describe the actual birthing process, but there are texts that do say that the, the, the human mothers would die after giving birth. Um, the Bible doesn't say that, and there's a comment on it, so I don't really get into that detail because um, there's not as much information that I was able to uncover about that. But the one thing, the, the few sources that I did find that referred to it, that was the one thing that I discovered. The other bit of confusion here for me is, in uh, Genesis, it talks about, uh, I believe, you know, the, the fallen angels, these sons of God, uh, I believe it uses the term marrying human women, but in Enoch, the book of Enoch, it talks about women being kidnapped by the fallen angel. So how did this pairing take place? Was there coercion involved? Were the women willing? Were they coerced? How did it play out? You know, I think that the, that the, the scripture really um, depicts this being more of a transaction, rather than a kind of like a, you know, a pillaging or forcible type of situation that was more of a transaction. And, you know, where my research led me was to Genesis chapter 4 in particular, and really just kind of hone in on the first, what I call the first family of the Nephilim. I think the, I think the Bible identifies the family that was the first to kind of enter into this transaction of sorts with these rebellious sons of God to offer their daughter, their daughter's hand in marriage, essentially, in exchange for supernatural knowledge. Do we know the exact location of where these fallen angels came down to earth and then where uh, they, they began to commingle with the daughters of men? Do we know where that happened? Yes, I believe we do. And I think that location is... Uh, the Jordan River. And I know that many other texts um, point to other areas like Mount Hermon, but I think that the Bible really highlights the Jordan River as being, you know, what I call the Area 51 of the Bible for the amount of supernatural events that occur there. And so um, just to give just a, a couple of, of examples at the Jordan River, um, first of all, it was, the, it was the gateway into the Promised Land that the Israelites had to basically march around the country to go through the Jordan River to get into the Promised Land under God's instructions. The kingdoms of Og and Sihon, these mighty Nephilim kings, were right on the shores of the Jordan River. You can look at the prophet Elijah. When he was raptured to heaven, it was, his specific instructions were to be at the Jordan River to, for a portal to open where, of course, uh, chariots of fire, divine angels came, descended down from heaven. The heavens opened up, and he was taken up into heaven. So um, the waters parted there for Joshua. And then, of course, the most famous event at the Jordan River, the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, was you know, at the Jordan River by Jesus' instruction to John the Baptist, and as he was baptized, what happened? The heavens opened, God the Father spoke from heaven for, for people to audibly hear, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove onto Jesus. All right, so uh, the, the identity of the, uh, the first human woman to have relations with a fallen angel, how did you find out? It's really two ways, going through, of course, through Scripture, and also uh, a big part of the, uh, the research I wanted to look into was, uh, it was really going through uh, the treasure trove of Hebrew and Christian writings on the Nephilim from the Church Fathers, and especially in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. There are a lot of sources that I don't think are commonly looked at today, and so I really want to go through them and bring them to light. And in my research, where I um, was really drawn to in terms of where did this start? Where did this actual intermarriage between the angelic and human realm begin? I really went to Genesis chapter four, and I think that's where we find the family. And I think it's in. Uh, I think believe that woman uh, is Nama, who is the daughter of Lamech, who is the seventh generation from Adam, but in the line of Cain, who of course was the wicked son of Adam and Eve. And I think there's a number of reasons that Scripture shows that this is the family that made the first transaction 
with the uh, fallen, rebellious sons of God in Genesis 6 and that led to this first marriage and the birth of the Nephilim. Well, let's take a few moments then and, and just walk us through how you identified Nima as the woman who first had relations with a fallen angel. How did you arrive at Nima? Sure. So the, the genealogies of the Bible um, have a very interesting pattern where it's usually just describing the father to the son of the next generation, where, you know, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob. But what you will find is that certain figures in Old Testament history get what I call a special reference, where they get, will get several extra verses devoted to them. And it's usually a more notorious figure in history. It's, you know, and I believe that's the, it's the Bible's way of telling the reader, telling us that this is something you need to focus on. There's something significant historically happened here. And when you get to Lamech in the lineage of Cain, which is listed in Genesis chapter 4, there are a number of verses devoted to not just him, but his entire family. And first off, he was the first person on record to violate the marital covenant because he took two wives. And in Genesis 4.19, it says that he took unto him two wives, Ada and Zillah. Um, interesting choice of words there because that's exactly how the sons of God are described in Genesis 6 as taking wives. And so, of course, he was the original polygamist. And then we get this description of his entire family where his sons, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubalcane, became the forefathers of arts and sciences, where Jabal became uh, a, a, a master and forefather of, of all of tent making and raising cattle, animal husbandry. Jubal became the father of music and the first inventor of musical instruments. And Tubalcane uh, was you know, a, a master of metallurgy, blacksmithing, an artificer of metal. So he, he was a blacksmith, essentially. And they, these sons had this technological and intellectual explosion in their family. And at the same time, we're told that the sister of Tubalcane was Nema. And so from my research, what I, what I concluded was that this was the time when the sons of God approached this particular family to exchange knowledge for Nema's hand in marriage. And interestingly, there are several sources, again, going back to um, several, a few centuries, um, that actually identify Nema as well. And so I'll just read a quote from a, a Christian magazine called The, uh, the Rainbow, and this is from 1883, referring to Lamech, and it says, he also, meaning Lamech, also had a daughter, Nema, who was beautiful, but she was not to be the mother of the promised seed, but rather the fountain when sprang much of the fairness among the daughters of men, which not long after tempted the angels to go after strange flesh, and brought on their defection from God and the fearful corruption of the world before the flood. Hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, Nima being the sister of Tubal-Cain. Yes. Um, I seem to recall, according to legend, it, and you mentioned that he was sort of the father of metallurgy, and this would have been knowledge that he received, I guess, in exchange for his sister's hand uh, to, be, to be married to a fallen angel. But Tubal-Cain, if I'm not mistaken, was the one who is credited with, with fashioning the spear tip known as the Spear of Longines, which was used to pierce Christ's side at, during the crucifixion. And whoever held the, the, the spear, the Spear of Destiny, as it is somewhat sometimes referred to, uh, and Charlemagne had it, and, and I believe uh, Hitler uh, had it, this person wields tremendous power. Uh, it, do I have that story right? Do you know about that? I have seen um, several uh, articles both recent and historical, that that reference to Bukane as that. In addition to saying that the god Vulcan um, was basically, was Tubalcane, and that he was deified um, in the ancient world as well. So Nima is, is offered up in this bargain. Uh, do we have a description of the fallen angel that she had relations that, with, that she married? Do we, was, it, was it Satan himself, or was it another fallen angel? Do we know? Yes, I 
believe that the first ruler, that once the, the giants were populating the earth and the fallen angels who were marrying human women were now taking over the, the world, um, I believe the Bible does identify who was the first sort of emperor over the antediluvian world. All right. Do you want to share that with us? Yes. He's referred to in the scriptures um, as the Assyrian, and it's primarily found in Ezekiel chapter 31 and 32 is really where we find a description of this figure, this angelic figure. And the, the thing to understand, first off, is that there are several passages in scripture um, that I refer to as esoteric passages, where the Bible is maybe referencing a king or a prince by name or by title, and but it's really a reference to, say, the devil or an angelic being. The most famous of those would be Isaiah chapter 14, where it says, Lucifer, son of the morning, all that have fallen, and it's listing, although it's initially addressed to the king of Babylon, most people acknowledge that that passage is actually referring to the devil. And so Ezekiel 28 is another example, but one example, but in one chapter, Ezekiel 31 is not often referenced in this way. But I believe upon close inspection, it's very obvious that just like those other two passages, that th- this passage, Ezekiel 31, is clearly referring in an esoteric manner to a fallen angel. I believe this Assyrian that's being described in this passage was the first emperor, the in- fallen angelic king of the pre-flood world. Now, for people out there listening uh, who, who don't believe in the Bible, are there other texts, um, for example, from the, the Sumerians, the cuneiforms, or anything like that, that corroborates this account that's also in the Bible? Yeah, absolutely. And so one example that I thought really stood out for me was the account of Plato's Atlantis. And so it's, it's, it's almost remarkable how similar the description of, you know, Ezekiel 31 basically describes the, the, the rise of this fallen angel, you know, spawning many children, having this, this great kingdom with an abundance of resources and uh, rivers and all sorts of military power and then cr- having it crumble. So I, what I basically did was just drew some parallels between that and the, the writings of Plato in describing Atlantis. And so, first off, in Plato's account, it was the Greek god Poseidon who was the ruler of Atlantis. He then fell in love with a human woman and, a human woman and impregnated her. And so, right from the onset, it was a god coming to the earthly realm and having conceiving a child with a human woman. Again, well, human woman, again, in the same fashion of Genesis 6. So the, the description of Atlantis was that it had all sorts of, of, of great minerals, um, gold, precious metals. In the biblical account, in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that the rivers that run out of Eden encompassed the, the whole land of, of, of Avila, where there is gold, and there is bdellium and onyx stone. There were numerous species in Atlantis. You know, what is one of the first things that happened in the Garden of Eden? that you see that there are animals that Adam has to, is in charge of naming. And so the formation and the building of Atlantis itself, which has really stood out to me, was that it was Poseidon basically carved, the way Plato describes the actual topography of Atlantis is that it was built as islands in, in five concentric circles, all leading to a central palace in the middle. And so um, I actually include an image, um, an aerial photo of Gilgal Rephaim, which is known as the Wheel of the Giants, which is in the Golan Heights, um, the same area in ancient times that was the location of the kingdom of King Og of Bashan, who, of course, is a Nephilim giant in the Bible, and is a series of five concentric circles. And, you know, this is... 40,000 tons of stone were used to build the structure and that still exists today. And it could only be properly viewed from the air. And so I, I have like just basically side by side a sketch of Atlantis based on Plato's description and Gilgal Raphaim. And you can see that 
the parallels there are just remarkable in the story itself and even in the description of Atlantis and the structure that was built that is still today named for the Rephaim, which are giants in the Bible. Uh, Ryan, the other thing that always conflicted me uh, as, as a child reading the Old Testament and believing in a loving and merciful God was all the smiting that was going on. The Israelites were ordered over to this village and they were to smite every woman and man and child in the village. And I thought, how could a, an all-loving and merciful God order the, mur- the murder of women, innocent women and children? Uh, so explain that in the context of this Nephilim infestation, if I can use that term. Absolutely. So in Genesis chapter 3, from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, and Adam, Eve, and Satan were all punished by God at that time, you know, Satan was told in Genesis chapter 3 that his defeat was going to come through the seed of the woman, that a child, a male, a male child was going to be born at some point who was going to be his conqueror. So from a strategic standpoint, Satan was on notice that the human race was a threat to him, a great threat to him, even though we on appearance were inferior, of course, to angels, there was going to be a child who, who, who would conquer him. And so the, what this is all about, this war was about preventing the birth of the Messiah, about corrupting humanity to make us something other than human, other than being made in the image of God to prevent that from happening. And so the Nephilim were that threat. You know, I, in, in the book, I call them, they were like Satan's nuclear bomb against the human race, that if we could, if this, if this giant DNA could propagate and spread and corrupt hum- humanity genetically and spiritually, there could be no redemption. And so this is why God had take such drastic action against them. And when you look at even the wars against the Canaanites, it's very targeted. It's specifically targeted against certain nations and peoples. It's not just a wholesale slaughter. And after the defeat of King Og and Sihon, the Israelites are told to avoid certain uh, nations altogether and not touch them. So they were forbidden to. So, and, and what I show in the book is that you can trace all of the giants back to Canaan. And so what God was doing was removing this threat to preserve humanity, to, re- to preserve our chance at redemption, to preserve our chance for freedom from sin. From and receiving eternal life and being reconciled to Him, so this so this book is really about showing how God loves humanity and is protecting humanity. And the interesting thing is that time and time again, when it comes to the Nephilim giants in the Old Testament, God Himself would actually fight against them, um, and basically, basically the Israelites were coming in to clean up the mess. So when when God was ordering the Israelites to go in and smite. The the uh, the women and the children and the men, you know, don't leave one stand, don't leave one left standing. He was ordering them basically to kill these hybrids. Is that the idea? Exactly, and 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 that's why. So they weren't fully uh, human. They weren't fully human. They were not fully human, precisely, and this is why we see such drastic military commands being given. Because I mean, it, it it really, and I think that understanding the Bible in the context of the Nephilim makes it, now these questions can be answered and they will make more sense when you understand that they were battling another race of being that could potentially threaten the, the future of humanity. That's why there were such extreme measures taken to wipe them out. So the, the game plan here was to so corrupt the human gene pool that you would forestall any bloodline giving birth to the Messiah. Precisely. It's starting to make some sense. Sally Marzulli, author, lecturer, filmmaker, has penned at least eight books, including the Nephilim trilogy. First of all, you've got to explain who the Nephilim are. There is an ancient prophetic text which which sets up um, something which I believe has been carrying on for literally thousands of years, and it's this. And it's actually from the book of Genesis, first book found in the Torah. And it says, and, and, and here's the backstory. there. You've got the God of the Bible... Adam and Eve, and you got the serpent. And the God of the Bible basically states something which is profound. And he says this, Your seed, talking to the serpent, will be at war, at enmity 
with the seed of the woman. He will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. There's a prophetic narrative there, because the he that's talking about is, becomes Messiah. The seed of the woman eventually becomes Messiah. The seed of a serpent, three chapters later in Genesis 6, erupts. And what we read is something that's profoundly disturbing. We hear that the sons of God are the fallen angels, and they see the women, and they desire them, and they take wives from whomever they want to. They take these women, they impregnate them, and the offspring is a hybrid being, part angelic, part human, which probably means, and I'm reading into the scripture here, that they have superhuman powers on some level. Well, that see, that tells me, number one, that they, the Nephilim, are physical beings. Mm-hmm. They aren't spiritual by any means, are they? No, but they may have supernatural powers that mere mortals do not have. What's interesting is, apparently, one of the side effects was giantism. And what's interesting also is it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Then you've got our shooter, which is one of the guys that shot this thing. And he says the thing was about 12 feet, um, absolutely humongous, six fingers, six toes, flaming red hair. Uh, He moved with an agility and speed that just defied him. I mean, he just looked at it and went, how can this guy move that quickly? But he did. And uh, he impaled one of the soldiers, and they brought him down by shooting him. And there's probably 12 to 15 guys in this platoon. Uh, They shot him in the face. They basically blew his head off, is what they did, and down he went. Where did the Nephilim come from? I mean, it's th- these aren't cases of an- angels coming from heaven. To me, it sounds like they're coming from a planetary system out there. Well, and, and that's, that's up for grabs, isn't it? Look, anything that's not from this planet is extraterrestrial. So if I say an angelic being, call it what you will, is an extraterrestrial, now people can say, oh my gosh, but in essence, that's exactly what it is. Anything off-world... Is, uh, is an extraterrestrial, even if something that is off-world is interdimensional. And I believe what, what's happening is that these entities, wherever they're from, are interdimensional. You know, there's a whole, and I'm sure you know about this, there's a whole uh, talk of, of being bandied around on the Internet that we live in a holographic universe. Right. I mean, if that's the case, if that's the case, then it's like, where are we really, and what is this really? And does that mean that we're it? that there's nothing else out there, and I don't know. But, I mean, if we're in a holographic universe, then all bets are off. But it does explain some interesting facts. It explains the fact that when these so-called angelic beings come, they have the ability, the uncanny ability, to manipulate space, time, and matter, and energy in ways that human beings cannot do it. And so it appears like it's magic to us, but they just do it because it's, it's who they are. It's what they can do. It's, it's what they come in with, but they manipulate space, time, matter, and energy. And we read about this, we hear about this. So I, I lean to the, extra, you know, to the interdimensional hypotheses rather than the uh, extraterrestrial one. Is Other it... than that, we're right down, we, we're going lockstep together. We know that we're being visited. We know something is going on. There's a breeding program going on with the, within the UFO community. Hybrids are being created. The Nephilim were real. They were on the earth. The ancient structures that are all over the planet, from Gaza to Peru to you know, Machu Picchu, I mean, wherever you want to go. I mean, this is, in my opinion, it's, it's, you can't duplicate these things today. You can't. Even with the modern technology that we have, you can't build a wall like what we see in Sacsayhuaman. Isn't it amazing how when you read Genesis and just try to equate it to a real-life event, it echoes it almost perfectly? I agree. I mean, I'm I'm right there with you. Something is going on, and all of this is really hidden from most people. Even in the churches, most people never get into this stuff. You know, they read about supernatural events in in the Bible and the Torah, but when when they're faced with something, like we we showed that fairy, which this, of course, is the work of Jaime Massad, and Jaime Jaime allowed us to go with this, and someone, this 13-year-old kid, found it on the side of a road and and brought it to Jaime, and, and, and we were down there three years ago filming Watcher 7, 
And Jaime, uh, you know, let us film, and we interviewed him, and we interviewed the, the geneticist, Ricardo Rangel, and they did DNA testing on this thing. And, I mean, we were taken aback by what we were seeing. And, I, I mean, I'll just spill the beans here because people need to know about it. And we talked about it in the last show, but we did the x-rays of this thing. Jaime sent us the x-rays. We were there when they took the creature out, got an x-rays, and we, were, we had no idea what we were looking at because there were all these little white um, dots it placed asymmetrically in the body that showed up on the x-ray. We didn't know what it was. Well, I went to a veterinarian out here uh, in an undisclosed location near where I live, <laughs> and I sat with the vet, and he looked at the x-rays, and my first question to him, look, is this some kind of a, a, a hoax that somebody put this thing together from different animals? And he looked at it and said, you know, it, it, it's, I, I, part of me wants to go there, but if it is, it's done so masterfully. I can see everything. Everything fits together perfectly. There's spaces where the, you know, the, uh, everything attaches to the pelvic girdle and, and the bones of the legs and the arms are hollow, which would, which would make sense if something had to fly like that, where the wings attach. There's more mass, there's more bone, more muscle. So I, I said, well, what about these white dots? And he goes, oh, I've seen those before. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, they're BBs. And I went, what do you mean by BBs? And he goes, you know, like buckshot, like birdshot. And then the light bulb went off. And I went, oh, my gosh, this thing was shot out of the sky. And that, that explains, it explains the broken bone that we see in the X-ray in the leg. I mean, you can see it. It's fractured. Oh, it, it's, like it's bizarre. Now, the picture on the cover of the Nephilim hybrids, mm -hmm. that's the creature in that's a jar, creature, right? That's the creature in the jar. We sat on this story for three years. We're still investigating it. It's amazing how people who have never seen it, never looked at the x-rays, but they, but they think they know everything about it, and they don't know anything about it. We're not here trying to promote a hoax to people. We're not trying to do that. What we are trying to do is... What is this thing? And, and really and get to the bottom of it. Sure. Exactly. And I, I was leaning towards hoax the whole time until I sat down with the vet. And once he said birdshot, then I went, okay, so this is birdshot. These aren't little drops of hot glue, which is holding this thing together. And that matches the story of someone using a shotgun. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Is it possible that this creature, which has... A face of a human, basically, doesn't it? Sure it does. Could it be some kind of an insect? I mean, if you look at a praying mantis, mm -hmm. it looks like a little man. And then, you know, so take a different creature that has more of a human look to it with wings. Could there be some kind of insect or species out there that we really haven't uncovered yet? Look, anything is possible, and that's why more testing needs to be done on this thing. Um, since we went, since this thing went viral on YouTube, what was really interesting is I've had probably about three or four emails from different people who have had encounters with something ex very similar to what we show in the film and also in the book. Um, one one man went into his bathroom, flicked on the lights, and this thing was clutched to the screen on the outside clinging to the screen, and, of course, he completely freaked out. Someone else saw something drive by their car fairly recently that looked very, very similar to what um, we show in the video. And, and the guy, you know, I, I questioned him, and the guy went, look, whatever this thing was, as I'm driving, it didn't fly horizontally like a bat or a bird would. It flew upright, upright. In other words, the thing was standing and flying, and he was just, you know, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing type of thing? So we, we've had some people that have emailed me uh, telling their story, telling what they've seen, and, and that's what's so incredible about about being on coast and, and, and putting things on YouTube and getting the word out. All of a sudden, people start coming out of the woodwork, uh, and they're not afraid of ridicule. Uh, they're not afraid to tell their story, and so we're, we're getting some feedback on this, which is good. I'm not calling this thing a Nephilim hybrid. I don't know what it is. There's been no DNA testing that, that we've seen results of. Um, we have seen the x-rays. It does seem to be real. The face looks human, pointed ears, teeth like a lion. The wings are there. Uh, it's got claws for hands. I mean, I've, Jaime sent me a, a photo when he first got this thing, and it, on the hands, I mean, he's got r real claws. It's got a stinger on the tail, which is very unnerving. Yeah, it looks like very it would unnerving. attack you if it came flying yeah, by you. It's not a it's not a happy looking creature. I mean, it's no, just, it's, it's. And how tall is it? It's about nine inches, nine yeah. to ten inches. Can you imagine a swarm of them coming at no, you? No, I can't. I, I not at all. And you know what's really strange? 
George, you know, you, you, Southern California, hummingbird people, we, we've all been around a hummingbird. But the first time I heard a hummingbird, I didn't know what it was. I was startled by it. And I, I'm looking around like, what is this thing? And like six, seven feet away, there's a hummingbird. And I, I was just taken aback on how loud this thing was. Well, this thing's a lot bigger than a hummingbird. And the wings are larger. And we had someone that came on the record. She remains anonymous in our very first Watchers film. And she talks about seeing these things in an undisclosed location. And she was just taken aback by how loud the noise of the wings were. And interestingly enough, mm-hmm. the, uh, the prophecies which talk about these things being released or something that, that might look like, like the fairy that we talked about, we're talking about now, it said the wings sounded like many um many horses talk about the lovelock cave handprint what is that la now the lovelock cave is uh in in lovelock nevada and it it was uh, originally um it was a site of the paiute indian tribe first nation people native americans i actually spoke with a paiute native american elder about the cave one on one which is incredible i said you know, can you tell me about the cave? And she's telling me this oral tradition, which has been handed down through the centuries. She talked about these large, very tall, very strong, red-headed giants that lived in the area that would take the women, take the children, and eat them so they were cannibals. And what is now in front of the cave, it's a dry lake bed. But you go back a 1,000 years, and there was water there. It was very lush and very verdant. The cave has been sealed off by the BLM, and originally uh, the cave went way back into the hillside. We'll never know how far back it really went because it's all sealed off. So when you go there, there's really not much to see. There's just a cave. The legend that was told to me by this Paiute elderess was this, that the tribe finally got tired of having been raided by these giants, and these cannibals taking their children and eating them. Jeez. They, they had a war party, and they warred against the giants. And they basically give, gave them an ultimatum. Stop doing this, get right, or we're going to wipe you out. And, of course, the giants wouldn't do that. They retreated to what is now known as the Lovelock Cave, <clears throat> and they went deep into the cave. Interesting, it's always a cave, just like the Afghan giants. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. Yeah, really interesting with that. And so the Paiutes took all this brush and put it in the mouth of the cave and piled it and piled it and piled it. And then they set it on fire. And as some of the giants would run out, they were shot. Interestingly enough, in the dry lake bed around the 20s and the 30s, 1920, 1930, I I have the paper someplace to clip. Uh, I believe a 12-footer skeleton was found of a male and a 10-foot female. Very, very tall. And, of course, all that's hushed up. We have no idea where the remains might have been. Again, the BLM has gone in there and they sealed the cave off. An archaeologist, before they did that, archaeologists did go in, and I've got a a book actually from the twenties, which is really interesting because it's again, it's it's you got to kind of read between the lines, but there's there's hints of cannibalism, which ties back into the Paiute uh, legend of the giants. Now, in that book, it doesn't talk about very large skeletons. But in one of the accounts, uh, it talks about finding some seven-footers, which, again, is, isn't that large. It's not like the nine-footers I found out on Catalina, but it's pretty big. When you go to the Lovelock Cave, there, there are no electric lights. There's no tour guide. It, it's just a cave, and it's, it's essentially the mouth of a cave because they filled off uh, both, both tunnels that would go deep into the mountain. Those are completely sealed off. So there's really nothing to see. There's a wooden platform there. And you look up above, and the, and, the, and the ceiling is all black, blackened perhaps from a fire, which ties back into the oral tradition. And these guys were exploring around the walls of the cave. And one of the guys found this giant, what appeared to be a giant handprint on the wall. Well, these guys took pictures of this thing. They sent it to me, and I made a beeline out there. But I arrived about 30 days after the fact. So we get to the we get to the site. We're all excited. We hike up this trail. There's no one around. And you can, by the way, when you're in the mouth of the cave, you can see for miles, literally. It's 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 an amazing vantage point. Strategically, it would be a great place to defend and hole up, which is what 
uh, according to the Paiute tradition, the giants did. So we get there. We're all excited. The cameras are rolling, uh, and, we, and we're moving around to the place where the handprint supposedly was. Now, before I tell you what happened, that, that picture of the handprint, and there's this gentleman holding a knife to give you an idea, uh, like a Bowie knife, yeah. how big this handprint is. I mean, it's really large, about twice to three times the size of mine, and it's I mean, on the rock. I mean, clearly a giant's handprint. Absolutely. And it's there, and he posted it on Facebook, mistake number one. And <laughs> yeah. fortunately, so by the time we got there, and again, this is in a in the back recess of what is now the last remains of the cave, and you really got to be looking for it. There's no lights. You got to have flashlights, and you got to be looking for this thing. So we get there, and and Ron and Joe are freaked out because they can't find it. And Joe goes, or Ron goes, one of them basically say, "Look, it, this is the rock. I know this is the rock. This is the place. It's not there." George, someone had come in and either chipped it off, washed it off with acid, the bottom line was it was completely obliterated. There wasn't a trace of it at Vandals? all. Vandals? I mean, do you, do you think it was vandalized? No, I don't think it was no. vandaled no. at all. I, I think Suppression. It was, I, yeah, I, I think it was very deliberate by the powers that be. Of course, that's where I'm going to fall to, because that's what, uh, having been out in Catalina and, and seeing everything else that they do, that's the way the game is played. And they didn't want this out there. So what's interesting to me is that hand, ties back into the Native American oral tradition. Is it conclusive? Of course it's not. But it's another step in the direction of verifying the Native American oral tradition that there were giants, very, very large people with six fingers and red hair that weren't part of the indigenous population that were there and doing unspeakable things. And what I find interesting, the fact that they were cannibals ties right into the ancient book of Enoch, yep. which was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, I mean, they do. They 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 literally echo stories that we hear from what happened in the Middle East and in the, that area a long time ago. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's a definite connection between the two. Definite connection. It's not conclusive, but some of the DNA evidence I think that we we uh, uncover in the book and also in the film Watchers Ten points to that Middle Eastern European origin, and that's not supposed to be there. Tell me about the uh, ghost wolf. There is a clip that, that's being shown on your site. This was taken uh, at a Native American reservation in the Southwest. I, I spent time with this person and uh, looked at this, at the original footage, and this person who took it, this woman who took it, she's Navajo and born and raised on that reservation. She set up game trails specifically because in these areas because people were reporting strange things happening, going on at, at night. And so the whole purpose of the game trail being there was because there was something's going on, so she sets up the game trails to see if it's, you know, what, what's happening here. She calls it a ghost wolf. I think that's a huh. misnomer. It kind of looks like a wolf, but you see a pickup truck, and this thing appears from nowhere. It's like a, a, a gateway, an opening, uh, a doorway to another dimension opens up, and this thing that kind of looks like a wolf, but it's really, you know, it, I mean, that's what she's calling it. It's some sort of, in my opinion, a demonic manifestation. It jumps over the truck, hits the ground, and then it, in just a few bounds or whatever, it just leaps into the air and then disappears. And you know, I've watched this thing frame by frame by frame. What's interesting is on this reservation, there's all sorts of occult activity. I mean, all sorts of occult activity, and it's ongoing. Uh, everything from uh, multiple Bigfoot sightings to UFO sightings to very strange chimeras being sighted. It's, it's all over the map. Let's talk a little bit about skinwalkers. Skinwalkers, of course, a person who has got the ability to flip and turn into a shape shift into an animal, for example. You've come across some of that in the book. Not personally, and frankly, I don't want to, uh, for the obvious reasons. But I spoke to a man who had two encounters with it, and he has to remain anonymous. Uh, but he, I, I interviewed him, and he comes in on the record. That interview is verbatim in the book, Nephilim Hybrid. And look, I'm, I'm not calling a skinwalker, a Nephilim hybrid. That's just a generic term I'm using because we're not sure exactly what we're looking at. 
but it all links back to the dark side. That's the point. It all links back to the dark side. And I remember speaking to uh, one gentleman <clears throat> who was being trained uh, to become a skinwalker. And in order to attain the power, you have to kill a family member. Uh, he came on the record and told me this. So here's the, here's the first of the two stories that this, that this guy told me. He grew up on the reservation, Navajo reservation. And he and a bunch of buddies, like three or four guys, are walking in this one place. And he actually took me to the place. And it's sort of rolling hills with chaparral, cactus. Mm -hmm. it's, it's semi desert. I mean, it's, it's the desert. And as they're walking, it, it's getting around dusk. And they hear this piercing scream coming from the other side of this small hill. So these guys run up to the top of the hill. And what meets their eye and is coming up towards them just completely freaks them out. Now, these guys grew up on the reservation, so they knew about skinwalkers. But this was the first time that this guy had ever seen anything like this. It had the body of a man, the, the, the thighs of a man, but from the knees down, the legs of a wolf, and from the neck up. And it wasn't a mask, George. It wasn't a mask. From the neck up, it was a wolf's head, basically what we would call a werewolf. And, of course, they were absolutely terrified. And they ran like crazy, and this thing chased them and followed them. And they got to this house and slammed the door. And this thing was like scratching and pounding on the door. Uh, and, and then some weird stuff happened, and the thing went away. That's the first encounter. The second encounter is, to me, incredible. And it shows, um, you know, a person that's, that's schooled in spiritual warfare knows how to handle stuff like this. And this guy's father was a pastor, was a Native American uh, who became a pastor, became a Christian, then became a pastor. And there was a skinwalker that was terrorizing this one family, and there were death threats on this family. So one night, now the kid's about 21, and he's at home with his father. The phone rings, and it's this family, and they're, they're freaked out because the skinwalker is on the property, and they've seen it and it's coming to kill them. That, that's what it's there to do. And so this pastor, without any hesitation, George, <laughs> without any hesitation, he grabs his Bible and goes, let's go. And they get in the pickup truck, he, he and his son, and they drive over to the house. And this guy is not timid. He jumps out of the car and goes, where is it? And goes running at it. He goes running at it. And he's, he's yelling at the top of his lungs, in the name of Jesus. I mean, it's something right out of some novel someplace or some, you know, religious film. But the bottom line was this thing retreated. And, and it, 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 talking to the son, who at that time was 21, told me that they chased it into the brush and it moved again so quickly and, and with such agility that it would move from, like, one place to the other place. And, and it, was, it was difficult to find, but they, they got it in, into this one place and then it just, it just sort of vanished. It just went away. Um, and they, they saw the prints around the house. They saw the wolf prints around the house. So it, it was interesting to me. And, I, and I, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to sound religious here, but this guy, this guy dealt with this stuff. You know, he dealt with it one-on-one. -on -one. And that power in that name chased the thing out. And that, not his authority, but the authority of someone greater. With all these things you've looked at, L.A., what does this tell you about what's happening here? <laughs> mm. I think what's happening, George, I think that the veil that separates the unseen supernatural dimension from the natural world that we live in is getting very, very thin. Uh, I remember a few, a few shows ago we were talking about black-eyed kids on, on your show, and that was in, in Watchers 5, and uh, we interviewed people like David Weberly, who was just in, in, oh, an expert on that. incredible researcher. But we sat down with a woman, Leah Campin, who came on the record. She had an encounter with this thing, and Richard Shaw did a wonderful job reenacting that in Watchers 5, and it, it looked like something out of the X-Files. But these black-eyed kids are real. Um, and I get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess I get at least one a month an email from a first-person account where someone uh, has, has an encounter with it. There was a woman... That, that just wrote me recently, like in the last 24 hours, uh, her, her husband, who is no longer with her and passed away several years ago, uh, she watched his eyes go completely black. Uh, com and that's what she wrote me about. She saw or heard me talking about it, and she, and she wrote me asking about 
you know, what, what was this? What did I see? Uh, and this guy's eyes went completely black. And, and we've heard more, like I said, I get about one a month, roughly, from somebody that, that has an encounter. So something's going on. I think things are shifting. Um, the fact that we've got that fairy that, that even though it's, it's been a while since Jaime's had that thing, thing things are happening. Things are happening, and, it, and it's sort of unnerving. Are other researchers taking note of all of this? Well, yeah. There, look, some of this stuff is, is met with a lot of skepticism, and I mean, I get that. For instance, our DNA evidence has been met with a lot of skepticism. Not a lot of skepticism, but some skepticism. And, you know, in the book, in the book Nephilim Hybrids, I reproduce the letter, the complete report from a Lakehead University up in Canada, which talks about the DNA. And they had, George, you've got to remember, they had no idea what they were looking at. They have no Nephilim dog in the hunt. All they're doing is they're taking a sample and they're testing it. That's it. That's all they're doing. They have no idea where it's coming from. We told them it's ancient DNA because we did a carbon-14 dating on it, and we know it's about 825, 850 years old. We know that. That's all we told them. So it's paleo, ancient DNA. And the, the, the uh, DNA testing came back. The mitochondrial DNA was extracted. The mitochondrial DNA was uh, then shown to be from the haplo group, and that's from the mother's side of the family, T2B, which is Syria and Mesopotamia, which is, in my opinion, and that's a part of our hypotheses, I call that Nephilim Central, because that includes the area known as Mount Hermon, and the late David Flynn waxed eloquent about this, talked about the 200 watcher angels coming down in the days of Jared that we read about in the Book of Enoch that's on Mount Hermon. Let's get a better handle for a lot of people who may not be uh, abreast on the Nephilim, who might not be versed in who they were. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about them? I certainly shall. I'd like to start off by reading a passage from the Book of Enoch. This is a pseudepigraphical book, which means that even though it's attributed to Enoch, it was probably written by someone else. This book is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's at least 2,000 years old, might be a little older. And let's, let's see what it says. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and have children with them. And here's a very important name to remember. And Samyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear that um, you will indeed not agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And the other angels said to him, let us swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual agreement not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. So they swear um, an oath to Samyaza, and then they land on Mount Hermon. And what happens, of course, after that is they take the women of earth, and they go into them, they have sex with them. And um, the children that are born are of a Nephilim. The Nephilim are the offspring of what I believe to be angels, fallen angels. In the Hebrew it says, Benayo Elohim. In the, in the Old Testament scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, that Benayo Elohim is always indicates angels. Now, it doesn't differentiate between good angels or bad angels, but it's always angels. Right. Now, did these angels, these fallen angels, Lynn, manifest themselves to look human, or did they look human in the first place? Good question. Real good question. And, of course, the, the text really doesn't doesn't answer that. Um, let me point to another story, which might answer that. Okay. All through ancient Hebrew scriptures, when angels do appear, oftentimes they're just mistaken as men. They're mistaken as men. So mm -hmm. I believe that they were probably very good-looking men. Right. But I also believe that they have the ability to shape-shift, and we can get into that later. Okay. So they they come down. Uh, Shams Yazi is, is what? Their kind of the ring lead leader. angel. Okay. Correct. Um, a good guy, right? A good angel? No, I believe he was a fallen angel, one of the okay. bad guys. Okay. Okay. So, so his mission then wasn't uh, well intent. Well, what, what they're doing... You know, if, if you actually get into the story and you read it, what I think the whole purpose of this thing was to somehow um, ruin the genetic line of man. And there's a reason for that. We can get into that later. Mm -hmm. But I think that this, when they first came down to the time of the flood, which is the judgment for what they did, and wipes out, according to, if, if you believe the stories, I do believe the stories, wiped out over the earth. It was a global flood. If that really happened, then you have about 400 years from the time they first touched down 
on the planet to the flood. So a lot of mischief was done. A lot of stuff happened. And they also, in order to do that, in order to gain the access to the women, and here's a point which, might, which we might get into a little bit later, in order to gain the access, they actually had to have permission from mankind. And what they did is they dazzled early man, or at least the people that were inhabiting the earth, with some sort of technology. And it says specifically um, weapons. They showed them weapons. And, of course, if we, if we leap up into, let's say, what we all know is the Roswell incident right. and what happened there, and the technology, people like Bob Lazar talk about, you know, the technology, the back engineering, and, you know, all that is, I, w- I don't want to say folklore, but people have come out and talked about it. And when enough people start talking about it, you begin to wonder. But there are similarities between the Roswell trade and the trade that happened thousands and thousands of years ago. There seems to be like, okay, we'll give you access to the population, we'll give you access to the women, we'll take the weapons and everything's fine. Or, course, or maybe the fallen angels scared the heck out of humans at the time with their weapons. Maybe we didn't have a choice. That's kind of interesting. Although I, I kind of lean to the lean to the way the text says that they didn't. There, there seemed to be like um, a, a mutual agreement. I mean, you know, here are the weapons; these look good, and you know, we'll give you access to the women. But I, I hear what you're saying. That's a possibility because the text you know, doesn't go into that. But you know, you could probably you might be able to read that. You anyway. know, why, for example, you go into Iraq and, and hand weapons to insurgents to say, "Hey, we want you to calm down. We we want to be able to." Uh, uh, breed with your women, and, and here's some weapons. I mean, it's like you're giving weapons to someone who's going to turn, turn and use them on you. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a supernatural being, an interdimensional being, True. which had so much power to begin with that it was just, you know, they can appear, let's say, in a very benevolent way, a very kind, gracious way. And, of course, what we're talking about is deception here. So these guys, the men of the earth, believe what they're saying, allow, take the weapons, they're dazzled by it, and let's say the deception continues. Of course, it, re- it reaches a point where they realize that they've been duped. And well, then, and then one of the things I'm, I'm going to want to find out from you is your thoughts on, because this is going to, this crosses spirituality and also the possibility of universal science in that these fallen angels possibly could have been extraterrestrial beings, right? Well, I mean, this is, this is, this is the whole um, crux of the matter. It's like you either, we either have to agree on what the texts are saying and what the people who wrote the text believe that they were looking at. And then we have, is there, like a, is there an overview that we can take over thousands of years um, from different texts that basically talk about the same thing? So if we believe that they're extraterrestrials, that's one worldview. If we believe that they're disembodied, if we believe that they're fallen angels, it's a separate worldview. And, of course, the more I study about fallen angels, the more it seems to fit and really cover all bases. It covers the abduction phenomena. It covers the breeding program, which, of course, I believe will, um, I believe that the Antichrist will show some sort of a connection to what we call alien, you know, a- alien presence. You know, you have, you have two worldviews here. And my worldview is that these are fallen angels. They're interdimensional beings. And, they're, and some of them are very, very powerful. Tell me more about the ancient manuscripts that you've researched, because to me, that's critical. The people who wrote them, the stories that they carried on. Well, let, let's take, for instance, I mean, the Book of Enoch is, is, is an amazing book. And actually, in the, in the Ethiopian Bible, it precedes the Book of Genesis. So it gives you an idea that you know certain certain sections of Christianity have embraced the book, while sure. other sections have not embraced the book. Apparently inspired by God, but who do you think really wrote the book? Hard to say. I, I have no idea. It, it could have been an oral tradition by Enoch, and of course passed down and eventually written down. Mm-hmm. You know, most things were done in an oral tradition. But what I love about it is it's a window into the antediluvian world. It's a window into what happened if if we believe in the Noah flood. And of course, you know. Um, uh, the, the Sumerians, you know, have a flood story. The Chumash Indians out in California have a flood story. Right. Well, that's it seems true. to be universal. And so I do believe in the flood story, and I believe it was a universal flood. I don't believe it was located, let's say, in the Middle East. So, you know, you've, you've got this incredible dynamic happening um, with these beings that are here, and, and the Book of Enoch gives us a window into what happened. And other scriptures or other texts, really, you know, they kind of gloss over it. For instance, the Genesis story in the Bible, a Christian Hebrew Bible, speaks of 
talks about that in Genesis 6, talks about the flood, talks about the fallen angels coming down, talks about the Nephilim, but it doesn't really get into the depth of it the way the book of Enoch does, where, you know, the fallen angels realize that, you know, we've really goofed here, we shouldn't have done this, and they send Enoch with a petition. And Enoch comes back to them, and this is amazing when you, when you, when you think about it. Enoch comes back to them and says, um, this is the answer, you shall have no peace. You shall have no peace, which is an incredible statement. And, of course, the angels, or the fallen angels, are just blown away by this. Yeah, they're probably trying to figure out what's going to happen to mm-hmm. us. You had mentioned a breeding program. I, that, that's fascinating to me. What do you mean by that? Well, according to the Book of Enoch, this, this was going on, uh, this, this inbreeding between what I believe fallen angels and the women of Earth. And so the offspring were the Nephilim, and, and they were, they were giant, gigantic in stature. In fact, I want to skip over to Josephus. This is from the first century Jewish historian. Josephus says, There were till then left the race of giants, who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. Surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day unlike to any credible relations of other men, which means that during the first century, the bones of the Nephilim were openly on display in Jerusalem, and um, anyone living in that time would have seen them, could have seen them. How big do you think they were? 12, 14 feet. Oh, my God. You know, Goliath, the Bible, you know, we always talk about David and Goliath. It's it's part of our culture. Yes. We all know that. And a great story. it, It is. But Goliath was, I believe, a Nephilim. I think you're right. And and what's bizarre about that is we know that the flood happened. We know that these, everyone is wiped out, supposedly, except for eight people. And from that, the world is repopulated. So it begs the question, wait a minute, if Goliath is a Nephilim, how did he get there? And, of course, if you go into the Hebrew Scriptures, if you go to Numbers 13, there's, there are two spies that are sent in by Joshua into the prom, or by Moses into the Promised Land. I'm sorry, 12 spies are sent in by Moses into Canaan, which later becomes the Promised Land, which is later, which we know as Israel today. And they come back, and, and all of them go, hey, look, you know, the Nephilim were in Milan, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And because of this report, uh, the people don't want to go into the land. But Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, go, hey, we, we can do this. We can take this. So the giants were in the land at, at that time. Now, it begs the question, how did they get there? Well, I was going to say, I have no answer for that. genetically speaking, if the fallen angels look human-like, mm-hmm. uh, which would also be probably in size, um, how did we end up with 12-foot giants? And I, I, I don't have an answer per se, except that you know their DNA is obviously different than our DNA, mm-hmm. and when you mix them, you get, you get giants. You, you get people who are 12 to 14 feet in, in, in height. And, and I guess there uh, are no survivors from that past civilization? Well, it's interesting. You know, even, the, even in the Americas um, during the last century, in places like Ohio and in the Midwest, they would come upon mounds and they would see what they believed were red-haired giants, that bones with skeletons um, over nine feet tall in some cases. So whatever is going on here, uh, the, the idea of that there's a race of giants that somehow um, continued after the flood, or let's put it this way: let's say if the angel, the fallen angels, did it once, maybe and, and according to the Numbers 13 uh, scripture that we talked about, where Joshua and Caleb and the, the spies go into Israel, if they've done it once, it seems like they they can do it again. They're allowed access for some reason. They're allowed access. Now, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how they got back in, you know, and why the overseer, call him God if you would, right. would allow them to come back to in. Come That's back a mystery. In. And if you jump into modern times, which we can get into a little bit later, I believe the Holocaust, and this, this is a whole, you know, <laughs> a whole different bag here, but, you know, Hitler, the, the occult connections of the Nazi party, what they were into, uh, I believe that the Holocaust was very deliberate. I believe it was luciferically inspired, and I believe it cracked open an opening which allowed the uh, entrance once again of the fallen angels into the world. Hmm. Fascinating theory. Any proof of large dwellings or structures? Are they found anywhere on this planet where these people might have reside? It's interesting. When 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 you speak about that and you start looking at the megalithic structures, that are not only in the Middle East, but they're, they're everywhere. 
You know, South America has them. I'm thinking, thinking of Chichen Itza for one, Machu Picchu for another. Obviously, the Great Pyramid. Baalbek is, is one that one of my favorites that comes to mind. And 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 many of these, the the local legends say. For instance, Chichen Itza, the, lo- the local legend says that the giants built them. Uh, Baalbek, the same thing. It's separated by thousands of miles from Lebanon to where Chichen Itza is located, thousands of miles different, and yet the local legend says the giants built them. And if you're familiar with Baalbek, some of the stones are just, you know, we have trouble moving them today. Some people think it might be an ancient landing pad. Could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could be. The technology of the day. Do you think there was some tremendous high technology here? You talked about weapons, for example. They must. Where did where did this technology come from? Exactly. It it it, it begs the question that if they're showing weapons, that means they had some t- sort of technology, which means that the nuts and bolts theory of behind UFOs could be real. In other words, just because they're fallen angels, and just because we're not sure exactly what they can or cannot do, uh, scriptures and texts, ancient texts, aren't really exhaustive on what their capabilities are. You know, it doesn't say, you know, fallen angels can only do this. We know certain things. We know that they can disguise themselves even as an angel of light. We also know that they can appear as men. I believe that they can shapeshift. But I also believe that, that they're super scientists. And I believe that they could, they're capable of creating all sorts of things. Certainly the nuts and bolts hardware of a UFO. What we call a UFO. Any tie-in with Zechariah Sitchin's Sumerian theories of the Anunnaki and the fact that they came here 400,000 years ago? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm familiar with it. I don't hold to Mr. Sitchin's theories. I, you know, again, it's like it's a different worldview than I have. Um, I, I respect what he comes up with, and he's done some fantastic research. I just don't agree with his conclusions. And I, I believe that, uh, you know, for me anyway, that the best the best answer to that is the fallen angel theory. That what we're looking at is interdimensional beings that could be perhaps millions of years old. We're, we're not sure how old these beings really are. We're not sure when this rebellion in the heavenlies took place. We only know that it did take place, and that you know when that happened, things things really got out of control. And and why really, Lynn? Why come here? Well, let me answer it with, with the idea that um, in, in ufology, oftentimes, they seem to come here and tell us that um, somehow uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, uh, really didn't have to die on the cross, or that he really wasn't the Son of God, or that he was genetically manipulated to be Messiah. Why come, you know, thousands of miles to tell us that? Why not give us the cure to cancer? Or millions. Exactly. But in, in the Nephilim trilogy, it, it speaks of that. There's a whole chapter where, you know, the protagonist, one of the characters, is really wrestling with this whole theory. It's like, if, they're, if it's nuts and bolts hardware and they're coming from millions of miles, like why, why come here and tell us this? Why go out of your way to tell us this? Why not, you know, give us a cure to cancer or, or something right. more useful? Why do you believe the Nephilim ended up, became so wicked, so evil? I mean, where did that genetic trait come from? You know, I, I, I thought about that on, during the break, and I would answer that with another question. Um, what makes someone like Pol Pot mm-hmm. do the things that he does? Or it's Hitler, like, or Hitler, same exactly, thing. Exactly, yeah. same idea. I mean, you know, killing six million Jews, deliberately killing six million Jews and millions of other people, um, it, it makes you wonder. I mean, they're not born that way, and somehow they become these monsters that later on in life they manifest who, who they really are. It seems like, you know, that, that this evil is real, that it's, um, it, it, it's, it's more than a force, that it can be personalized. It has great power. We see it manifest itself on this planet from time to time. Um, certainly Hitler, Pol Pot would be one. Idi Amin would be another. The slaughter that happened in Rwanda would be something. The civil war in this country where um, a great atrocity has happened. Maybe the genocide of the Indians could be looked at in, in, in the same way. But um, getting back to the fallen angels... Something happened. In other words, they fell from grace. They fell from a state where they were, they could look at the overseer, God if you want to mm-hmm. call him that. They could look at this guy. Something happened. There was some sort of a rebellion. And because of that, because of that rebellion, they changed. And that's why when he says to them, you shall have no peace, I think their peace was taken away. Mm-hmm. And when their peace was taken away, they fell into the state which which further degenerated over the aeons of time. Is it possible that humans today have this mean, wicked, genetic streak in them because of the Nephilim? 
I don't think so. But I, I do think that, that human beings, all human beings on this planet, seek one thing. They seek peace. You know, everyone, everyone is looking for inner peace. I hate to sound that way. I'm not sure Every, if it's everyone. everyone is looking for inner peace. Everyone wants, you know, to be free of stress and to have peace in their, in their lives. I know. I, I think peace, there's some people, Lynn, who just always want chaos. I agree. And then there are people that deliberately have given themselves over to the other side. Right. Well, in the fallen angels scenario, wasn't Lucifer part of that group? Of course. I believe that Lucifer... Um, which means um, light bearer, uh, at one time, apparently, according to ancient manuscripts, was one of the big guys, one of the big cheeses, one of the head angels, if you were. And he was the guy that led the rebellion. Do you think he walked this planet? I think I definitely think he walks the planet. Um, certain, uh, certainly, and in, in, again, going back to ancient texts, we see that there's one, one passage that comes to mind where there seems to be a, a council being held, and... Um, these angels, both fallen and good, present themselves to God, to the overseer. And um, the overseer, God says, um, where have you guys been? And Satan says, I have been to and fro walking over the face of the earth. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a direct quote. Now, I wasn't there at the meeting, so I can't prove that he said it. But what I find fascinating, and the reason, getting back to Mr. Sitchin, and why I don't hold to his worldview, the one thing that, that the Hebrew Scriptures especially have that that the Sumerians don't have, is a constant thread of prophecy which has been fulfilled in the past and is being fulfilled even today. And that's why I, I, I lean very heavily and very strongly on those scriptures, because it seems that someone who's writing this stuff seems to be dwelling outside the space-time continuum right. as we know it. Absolutely. They, know for, they know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. It would be like in a helicopter above a parade. If you and I, George, were on the street looking at the parade, we'd see the Mickey Mouse float go by, and we'd wave to the people and, and wait for the next float. But if we were in a helicopter where the overseer is, we'd see the whole parade from beginning to end. So the overseer, it's nothing for him to go, hey, I can, I can go back, and this is the last float over here. Well, but see, what we could not say, though, is whether that Mickey Mouse uh, uh, exhibit tips over and falls into a, you know, a pile of people. Mm -hmm. Yet, in, in the Scripture here, in Hebrew... They have, they have, you know, the book of Revelation. They have the vision of what will happen. Well, do, you and I couldn't see that. It, correct, correct. But w the people that, let's say, John on Patmos, um, and this is written around 90, 90 years at, or 90 A.D., so it's after the fall of Jerusalem, and what he talks about is something so futuristic and so bizarre that through the centuries, a lot of Christian scholars have not looked at the book, couldn't understand the book. And I mean, I've I read it numerous times, and there's a lot of things in the book of Revelation that are very difficult to understand and sometimes hard to deal with. The thing is, I believe he was taken there, and I believe he was shown that. Because, again, if you have this being, if you have this God who dwells outside the space-time continuum as we know it, it's nothing for him to show what will happen. I mean, we, you and I are bound, the whole human race is bound by this linear progression of time. You know, I'm talking to you right now, and the mm -hmm. seconds are ticking. I can't leap into the, into the future. I can if, if um, let's say, I'm anointed that way, True. or if the, or the you Spirit knew the, of God came upon me. Or you knew the secret. Well, I, I believe that in order for me to see ahead, I would have to have the Spirit of a living God come upon me and show me something. Now, I've had little things little glimpses of my own personal life from time to time, which I believe are, dare I use the word, spirit-led, but I do. I do. I believe that I've had glimpses of things that will happen, and then they have happened. Your books, the trilogy, all have uh, either an, a UFO or an extraterrestrial look at it. The Nephilim, for example, sure. I mean, that it's got a shadowy figure on mm -hmm. the cover of what we have described as grays. Correct. Looks like uh, the bean coming out of the, uh, you know... Uh, uh, close Encounters. There you go. Um, revealing a uh, great graphic of a city with UFOs. That's, all... actually, that's actually the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's what I thought. Yep. That's right. And it's all lit up, and you've got UFOs over that. So somewhere in your fiction that is also into the nonfiction, you do believe that there's... But, but, so you believe in extraterrestrials. You just don't believe that it's planetary type, Right. I believe that the what we call extraterrestrials are actually um, fallen angels 
that are part of this, what I believe is the coming deception. I mean, it's already here. We're actually, we're, we're, we're talking about it tonight. So it's not something that like a hundred years ago, sure. you know, people, it wasn't part of the culture. Even in the fifties, it just started to become part of the culture. And now it's like, you know, everyone, most everyone knows what a gray is. You know, it's, it's been enculturated. And I believe that what we're looking at is, is a deception. The alien gospel, if I can use that term, is one of the main main points that they make is that we, the aliens, genetically manipulated us, the humans, over a period of thousands of years to produce modern man. Now, I, re- I just find that really interesting, and of course, some I, people I some too. people believe that. But it, what it does is it goes against, um, you know, every every account of ancient scripture, which speaks of. Man being created ex nihilo. Well, assuming a- assuming ancient scripture is correct or accurate. And the only reason why I believe the ancient scripture, this goes back to the prophecy thing, what I can kind of hang my hat on is the fact that whoever wrote this stuff seems to know the end from the beginning and the beginning from end, and it and it's and it's prophecy that's you know we we can look back at it and see it's fulfilled in one area, and we can also see it being fulfilled in our lifetime. Israel is a perfect example of the prophetic word being fulfilled. Now, these, uh, these fallen angels, do you believe they came here in flying saucers, UFOs? In a, some of the ancient manuscripts, some, some things from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about sun disks. Um, we've got, uh, through, through, the, through the ages, they talk about, witnesses t- talk about silver disks. Um, I think these things, uh, I, um, in, in ancient Indian... Uh, the Vedas. The Vedas, exactly, talks about um, you know, certain flying machines that they use. So the technology could have been there. I mean, why the technology is there, I, I don't. I don't really understand that. But you know, maybe their wings were clipped. I mean, I know that sounds kind of kind of silly. But what if, you know, what what if at that's that's how they kind of bop around the universe to to a degree? There's no answer to that. Well, what what if you're correct that they come from, let's say, different uh, time, different dimensions, but maybe it's a traveling through a wormhole or or something or some kind of bend in space, uh, but they but they need these craft to get here to do what they do. It, it certainly is very possible. It, it, another another idea would be that because they're in a fallen state, they have lost some of their mobility. That's why I was kind of being silly a little early and said their wings were clipped. You may be right. Maybe they've lost mobility. They took that away. Yeah, where it seems like other interdimensional beings which are benevolent um, just appear. Like if you look in the, in, the, in the Christian scriptures, which talks about the Annunciation where this angel just pops in front of this woman, Mary, and just says, this is what's going to happen mm-hmm, to you. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have this child, he's the most anointed, and you know, he's going to be the Messiah of the world. Okay, that's, that's interesting. The angel just appears from nowhere. Uh, when when Jesus apparently is, is resurrected, at one point in time, he just kind of walks through a wall and manifests himself in front of the apostles. And, you know, everybody's blown away. It's like, you know, they think it's a ghost. And he says to them, touch me, feel me, I'm, I'm you know, flesh and blood, I'm not a ghost, give me something to eat. And then, of course, he, he vanishes the same way. So there are laws here that we really don't understand, you well, know, that, yeah, that are beyond right. the science that we know, at least now. If if this is true, though, that they came here in craft mm-hmm. for whatever reason, mm-hmm. back about when? I'd say it has to be more than 10,000 years. Ago. Yeah, definitely okay. more than 10,000 years. Uh, and Between ten and twenty thousand years ago, craft are still like being that. seen. So craft that means the deception is still continuing. Well, the deception has been ramped up. I mean, now now it's like people are seeing them much more frequently than they were, let's say, a hundred years ago. Yes, there were sightings, but nothing like today. I mean, and at the end of World War II, with the Foo Fighters, nineteen forty-five, we thought they were the Russians. The Russians thought they were us. Right. You know, no one knew what was going on, and uh, you know, of course. The Roswell, the Roswell incidents, and, and now we have, um, you know, fires, fires. I get that once every week, and all these different sightings from all over the United States and all over the world. So it's, it's, it seems to be a burgeoning it's, um, phenomena. It seems to be manifesting much more frequently. Uh, certainly, I believe that the abduction phenomena has, has been ramped up. I think they have an agenda, and I think the agenda is deception. There's an ancient document which has never been translated to the masses, and for our purposes, we'll just call it the uh, the apocalyptic scroll. I'd love to hear about this. And he he said that he read this thing, and it what it said, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, was that at the end of some great battle over in Jerusalem for Jerusalem, 
that above the above the city were were suddenly appearing hundreds of sun disks, and his jaw dropped because he knew, you know, from his interpretation of that, he could only conclude that he was looking at, you know, some sort of a UFO manifestation. Now, was this a story that occurred or or story in the future? This is a story that 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 was spoken of a couple of thousand, maybe 2,500, 3,000 years ago. I'm not sure of the dating of that particular scroll, which has not been deciphered. I have no idea. But of an event that had occurred. No, not occurred yet. Not occurred. Not occurred yet. And what's interesting about this, and we, we can jump into this you know, now if you want to, but one of the scriptures in Ezekiel uh, 38 in, in the Hebrew Bible talks about a confederacy of nations. And this is, this is why I hang my hat on the prophecy. A confederacy of nations coming up against a land of unwalled villages. And when you think about that in the ancient world, and I, of course I get into all this in, in the books. It, it, you know, it's, it talks about this and extrapolate it and you know, characters banter back and forth interpretations. But in the ancient world, there was no such thing as a land of unwalled villages. The first thing you did is you, you built a wall you and a moat and, right. and defended it, and, you know, and, and that's what you did. So it's, it's, for someone to say something like that, is uh, is really preposterous when that when that book was written thousands of years ago to talk about at in the latter days i mean it's even that specific in the latter days a confederacy of nations will go up israel a land of unwalled villages to take plunder and spoil and that that to me is absolutely utterly profound to read something like that and what's interesting is the nations that are mentioned and and this should this should blow it blew my mind when i read it iraq you would you would if instantly from looking at a map today, let's say before the invasion, you would figure that well Iraq has to be part of this confederacy. Right. It's not mentioned, but guess who is Iran? Yeah, Iran is mentioned. Iran, Libya, and then of course the, whatever's from the north. Some people believe it, it's Russia. It could be Chechnya. We're not sure, but it's definitely a nation from the the north. More than likely, it's Russia. I believe it's Russia. And, and what is about what could occur? Well, there's a confederacy of these nations which which conspire. And remember. When this was written, there is no, there is no Islamic religion as we know it. There is no Islamic fascism, which is, you know, all over the planet. I think even tonight there's like a scare now in New York. Where yeah, about subway scare. Exactly. So you know, all these. This is it's part of our culture. It's something that we we have we're just dealing with now. The Israelis have been dealing with this thing since independence, and it's this confederacy of what are now Islamic nations which go up against Israel. And Israel responds, and it says very specifically how Israel, how Israel responds. It says that um, the, the Confederacy of Nations, while they are standing on their feet, their tongues will rot in their mouth, and their eyes will disintegrate in their sockets, which to me sounds very much like a neutron bomb, which of course we know that the Israelis have. Mm -hmm. So this Confederacy of Nations are pouring down, they're, they're attacking Israel. Israel has nowhere to go except to use its nuclear arsenal. They're being attacked on every side. And this fulfills that scripture. It's in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Do you think that's happening now? I think the stage is being set for it, absolutely. I think the stage is being set for it. And, of course, it's, it's all about the Temple Mount. Um, it's all about the city of Jerusalem, and it's, and it's all about the fact that in the Arab mind, um, Israel, the state of Israel, was once Arab land. And the way the Muslims look at that uh, once it once a land becomes Muslim and it ceases to become Muslim, let's say another country takes it over, mm -hmm. it becomes something else. It's the Muslims' duty to retake that land mm -hmm. for Allah. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this you've got this incredible tension, which is which is ongoing. We all know it's going, and, and this again fulfills what I believe is another scripture, well, another, well, another prophecy. This this uh, apocalyptic document that your friend saw. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't it been revealed to all of us? <laughs> Well, why wasn't the Dead Sea Scrolls translated and revealed? You know, Herschel Shanks had to basically photograph them and, and hijack them. And there's probably still some that haven't been exactly, given to us. Exactly, exactly. And, and one has to ask, you know, what are you guys holding up here? And this kind of stuff leads to the rise of secret knowledge or something was missing or something that's like what the Da Vinci Code is written on, but there's like some sort of secret secret that we've somehow missed over the thousands of years. And that tantalizes people. I mean, I've, I've read the books. You know, and, and, and he, he's a good author. I mean, I like his stuff. It's a very intriguing story. Of course, I don't believe, you know, what, that something is missing. I only believe that what, what the truth of what, what happened 2,000 years ago has been obfuscated by a lot of dogma and a lot of, a lot of religiosity. 